Hello, everybody. My name is Enrico Natalizio. I am a senior director with the Autonomous uh, uh, Robotic Research Center with the TII, Technology Innovation Institute of Abu Dhabi. And I'm glad uh, to introduce uh, our second speaker for the, uh, the series seminar on underwater communication is uh, Dr. Joao Alves. Uh, Joao Alves got his bachelor and master's degree in electrical engineering and robotics from the Technical University of Lisbon and he has been working in underwater robotics and associated technology since 1995. In 2009 he joined the NATO Undersea Research Center that is now the Center for Maritime Research and Experimentation as a scientist uh, working on underwater communication. In 2014 he took the leadership role for as a principal scientist responsible for the underwater communication and he conducted several sea trials as a scientist in charge. And in 2019, he took the leadership also of a wide programmatic area of uh, the Center for Maritime Research and Experimentation for interoperability and security of a maritime and managed system and was appointed as uh, the representative for the NATO Maritime uh, Unmanned System Initiatives. Uh, Joy received also the NATO Scientific Achievement Award in 2018 for his work as team leader in the development and promulgation of Janus, that I think everyone knows, and is the chairperson for the IEEE OES UCOM series of conferences organized by the Center for Maritime Research and Experimentation. Uh, Joe, it's a pleasure to have you as our second speaker, and I uh, immediately let you start your talk. Thank you very much. Enrico, thank you very much. Thank you also to uh, Julia and to uh, Ian uh, for the very kind invitation. It's really uh, an honor to be here uh, talking to you. Um, and, and so I, I would like to start precisely with uh, the fact uh, that I gave this, this title to my talk. So uh, uh, when bits get wet, this, this came from the fact that a few, uh, a few years ago, when I was uh, briefing a panel of people that uh, were working on the radio domain, I really was having trouble conveying the idea. So I, I, I was telling them about information flowing through the uh, underwater domain and they were they kept on, on coming back to me oh i see underwater cables and uh, not, not underwater cables say, oh what are fiber optics and so at a certain point almost in the moment of despair i i, I used the term no no the bits actually get wet and uh, while it was it, 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 it did not do much to to make them understand the concept at least it, it kind of stuck with me idea of conveying the, uh, the, the, the fact that uh, it, it's an activity that sometimes get, gets a little bit messy. And uh, I, I looked for uh, some sort of image where uh, we would have zeros in, in ones hung in a drying rack, but I, I couldn't find anything similar. So you're stuck with this blue screen saying when bits get wet, real world challenges and practical considerations for underwater communications. Um, Actually, the idea to assemble uh, the topics uh, that uh, I, I'm going to show you came from uh, my, my good friend Manda Shitra in, uh, when he gave a, a presentation late last year uh, in the NSF workshop where both of us were, were giving invited talks. Uh, so there is a little bit of inspiration I took from him. On, on addressing some of the, the, the practicalities and then some of the issues that arise that go beyond uh, the fact that the uh, underwater communication channel is, uh, is a difficult one. So what I'll do is I will, uh, I will um, uh, give you uh, a, a handful of uh, first person examples uh, of, of, of some very practical issues uh, that happened to me, so I can, I can, I can speak first person there. Uh, and af after that, I will talk always with a very practical uh, uh, approach, uh, a little bit about Janus. So I will jump in just to talk about CMRE, a very, very, uh, a very brief introduction about CMRE, where I, where I'm at. Uh, a scientist there. So this has been our center has been established in uh, in 1959. Uh, we've already had several names throughout the years. 
uh, we have a, a, a very wide range of, uh, of uh, core capabilities uh, inside, the, inside the center that range from uh, sciences and engineering. But I, uh, one, one key aspect uh, to the talk of today is the, is the very strong ability to go at sea to take our uh, work into the real real scenarios where they are going to be used uh, and that's why you see down there the pictures of the two research vessels that we operate which are central in the work that we do that together with the with the permanent uh, engineering staff uh, that we have that uh, takes care of the equipment and, and creates the conditions for the scientists to uh, to experiment with uh, with our ideas at sea so without any further delays i mean you've seen for sure, uh, in one way or another, uh, a diagram like this that kind of sums up a little bit or, or, or tries to capture the difficulties of uh, communicating underwater. This is the case for the acoustic, the acoustic channel. All different uh, uh, aspects of, uh, of uh, the, the, multi the multi path, the noise, the refraction, uh, scattering. Uh, all the losses, frequency dependent and non frequency dependent. So, all, all all the, the environment conspiring against us to uh, to uh, to uh, make our job uh, very very difficult indeed. Uh, the cases I, I I'm going to show you uh, from now on are, are are basically motivated that this is this just scratches the surface of the things that we have to deal with when we go when we go at sea. And I'll start with the simple one: biofouling. Uh, and the case for biofouling is we at CMRE operate something that is called the Littoral Ocean Observatory Network, the LOON, which is basically a series of instruments and underwater communications equipment that are cable to shore. Uh, you have a little map there on your left hand side that not only shows where CMRE is, but also where the different things are in the, in the, in the Bay of La Spezia. And uh, this allows us to conduct some level of experiments um, from our offices, which is very convenient. We, we can tie, we, besides the, the underwater communications equipment, that includes modems and arbitrary waveform generation and recording. We also have a series of uh, oceanographic sensing so that we can correlate uh, what, what we see in the environment to what is happening to the signals. So, operations at sea, we deploy every now and again, uh, in between servicing intervals, we deploy these tripods with the equipment, with the electronics and the acoustic equipment. Uh, but the problem actually appears or we, it becomes evident on the operation of uh, retrieval of the equipment at sea. Because as you can see here from these pictures, the equipment typically looks very different from the moment uh, it was uh, deployed. It's important to note that this is we're talking about very shallow, a very shallow environment between 10 to 15 meters of water depth, uh, warm waters, and uh, an arbor area with uh, with uh, quite some nutrients uh, in the water. A little bit more pictures of what can only be described as uh, disgusting, <laughs> but this is what we have to deal with uh, once we recover the equipment. And, and looking specifically at, at, at the, the equipment we use for underwater comms, uh, the, here is a side-by-side -side, uh, comparison of two pictures, one taken in June of, of, of a year, and the other one uh, just uh, uh, mark down what is the month that you think this was taken, and then at the end we will perhaps offer a prize to, the, to whoever uh, uh, guessed on uh, when this was taken. So there's only a few months elapsed for this to happen. Uh, but what is, be, what is beyond the, the biofouling? What is the practical implication of biofouling? So after we, we recovered, we asked our colleagues in the engineering to, to, to take the equipment to our calibration tank and uh, do some measurements. And specifically, we measured the, the TVR of the BTEC uh, transducer is the transducer. Some of you may be uh, may be acquainted with this kind of transducer used in the micro modem uh, in the micro modem uh, um, modems. And here you can see the, the red line is the TVR 
measured before cleaning the transducer, and then in blue, the TVR measured after cleaning the transducer. You can see here, I, I don't know if you are watching my, let me think on a moment, try to. Yes. You are watching my, let me see if I can have a pointer. I think there's a pointer here that makes it easier. Can you see now? Yes, sort yes, of a, okay. we can. Yep. You see here a span of 20 dBs in the in the transmit sensitivity uh, uh, before being cleaned and after being cleaned. So this this to say that uh, uh, whenever we go at sea and whenever we do this kind of deployments, that we need to expect a real impact as time passes by our equipment, especially in the, in a, in an environment like ours where uh, where the equipment is exposed to considerable amounts of uh, of biofouling. I have this uh, nice uh, biofouled family picture just for us to get uh, comfortable with uh, with uh, the fact that this is what we have to deal with on a, on a regular basis. Then second case, uh, dynamic channel or dynamic system, and I hope I can uh, can uh, convey why I call it dynamic system and not dynamic channel. I have a, a diagram you can see here just just to prepare for what you are about to see. You have uh, we have four static nodes that are shown by these four circles of four different colors. And then the links amongst them, or uh, the existence or non-existence of link between them is shown by a, a line uh, connecting the, 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 the circles. And if it is a thick black line like this one, it means that communication has passed both from the red to the magenta and the magenta to the red. If it's one color only, it means that only the, the packets that are coming from the node with the same color of the line are the ones passing. In this case, it's the blue listening, able to listen to what the green is transmitting. And in this case here is the magenta able to listen to what the blue is, uh, is transmitting. And this is basically a round of uh, this animation shows a round of uh, 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 round robin transmissions that was done for several hours on uh, on packets with, with commercial modems uh, on a deployment on the loon, uh, so as static as it gets, uh, with the eight byte messages and sixty four byte messages. So you can see even even here. When we talk about the, the, the channel being dynamic, you see that there's clearly a difference between the eight and the sixty-four. Of course, the, 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 here the, there are several factors that that enter into play, like the way you design your uh, error correction mechanisms may uh, may may be more prone to certain sizes of uh, of, mess of messages. Uh, but uh, I, I will show you now a different animation. Now with, with some moving assets. So besides three static nodes, not four, now we have three, and we have two mobile ones. One mobile one that was deployed from a, a 30 meter a vessel that we operate, that I showed you in one of the, of the initial pictures. And another one that is operated from a, a small, uh, uh, a rigid hull inflatable uh, boat, so a small kind of dinghy. Um, and, and the same logic for the uh, the same logic is used for the links. So bilateral, so uh, bidirectional links are shown with a thick black line, and uh, unidirectional links are shown with the thin colored lines. This is what we got. Also, a run of several, several. I think hours. I'm not sure if it was hours, but uh, I, I could recover that information. But what we see here is, uh, interestingly enough, what is the magenta, the magenta node being basically deaf to anything that is being transmitted to the other ones, unless it really gets very close. That's when you start to establish. Other than that, these packets are able to go, but is not able to listen to almost anything. The, rock, the rib one is able to maintain slightly better, slightly better links with the other. So this is a, a case of, Yes, we still have a dynamic channel, but it, it, the problem here is, is what we are introducing with these with this, uh, platforms that are carrying in the water communication systems. Are we introducing noise? Are we introducing uh, uh, um, some sort of uh, baffling? 
some sort of uh, uh, of shadowing into the transducer. So, looking at the magenta one, and our initial uh, our initial consideration was very likely was self noise it was a bigger ship, and uh, and uh, most likely the problem here was the self noise of the platform. So transmissions were able to to get through to the other end, but the, the receptions were basically masked. Uh, we we uh, we managed to do some profiling afterwards, and we confirmed this thesis of uh, of the noise. But again, this is to highlight that whenever we go at sea, whenever we put things working, we need to start thinking in a in a slightly more uh, complete way of the whole system that we have in front of us. Case three, another a very interesting one. I, I particularly like this one because this was very challenging when we had to face it. And I call it, how good do you think your data is? So let me motivate you with this, with this scenario. Well, still using the, 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 the same deployment I showed you before with the static nodes that are deployed on the seabed and are cabled together. Uh, we, we consider two of those that are more or less uh, uh, 1,500 meters apart. Uh, this was this deployment was done in a very challenging coastal environment close to our center, but not exactly in the, in the basin outside of our center, just outside the, uh, the, the coast of uh, of uh, the Palmaria Island. For those of you that who know the geography of uh, La Spezia, and uh, when we started exchanging packets, we saw something very nice, which was close to uh, ninety nine percent packet success rate which was an unprecedented performance for what we had. So we, we, we were starting to uh, pop the, the champagne and celebrating the breakthrough until, of course, we started looking more carefully at what we had. And uh, you would say, okay, yeah, sure. You can start looking at unique arrivals, of course. We did that immediately. Uh, and we saw we could, we could immediately seg differentiate two very stable arrivals, an initial arrival here designated by these crosses, black crosses, and a second arrival. And when we, we, we display them in this sort of, uh, sort of plot with the time relative to the first one, this is what we saw. And of course, we started making conjectures about the, uh, about the, uh, the environment we, we were operating in, and this, this would match a possible uh, bounce over uh, the, the, coast, the coastline. Uh, I mean, of course, when, when you try to do reverse explanation of what you see, it, uh, the, there were plenty of, uh, of possible explanations for this behavior. But then when we started looking more carefully at this time and, 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 and tried to put the time, a, a different reference in the time, instead of having the time relative to the first arrival, and since we had synchronized clocks between the nodes, uh, do the time relative to the transmission. That's where things got interesting. Because when you do the time relative to the transmission time, the first arrival arrived 0 0.4 seconds after the transmission, which if you remember what I said, that the nodes were around 1,500 meters apart, it just doesn't make sense. So it meant that this was faster than the speed of sound. And this actually makes sense, this one, is actually uh, an arrival that uh, that matches what we were expecting. So, this, of course, as you can imagine, the uh, the, the the are we doing something wrong with the with the clock synchronization? Is the time stamping correct? I mean, there was a lot going on until we understood what the real problem was. And the real problem problem can be, I, I think, I can show you here in this animation. I hope you can see that was that we had a faulty or a series of faulty uh, um, isolation transformers in the power supplies. And it was through the power supply that there was doing, that there was some coupling happening in this way. As a matter of fact, the acoustic was arriving, but before there was electromagnetic noise uh, uh, that was being, uh, uh, oops, that was being uh, carried through the cable enough to trigger uh, a reception at, uh, at, uh, at this node that was receiving the acoustic information afterwards. 
Uh, we made additional measurements that uh, further corroborated this thesis and eventually uh, our engineering team uh, went to uh, to replace those isolation transformers and as a matter of fact that solved the problem problem no, was no longer there but it kind of makes you wonder uh, the thing that made me wonder the most about this was how many wrong conclusions have we have we made in the past based on on data that maybe tempered without us even realizing that it was tempered uh, uh, how many how many of of these kind of faults are hidden inside of our data it's it's it it, it almost it, it became almost a, 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 a haunting uh, uh, prospect if you if you know what i mean it's, uh, it, it's at a certain point it's almost better to stop thinking about it because you start questioning everything that you have done but uh, um, at the same time, it really is an eye opener. It, it's it's important to be to 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 be open to the possibility that there may be things that you don't know that you don't know, if you will. Uh, uh, so so this I, I particularly enjoyed the process of uh, of digging through this one and, and, and understanding a fundamental problem that that was there uh, uh, with this experiment. Also, because if you think about it. Perhaps it was the fact that we had the kind of a 99% success rate that, that made our mind kind of uh, 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 go into thinking mode. Because what if it was only 60%? Perhaps we wouldn't think twice and just take the conclusion for what it was. Uh, so, as I said, it is, it, it, this makes us almost go into some uh, meta thinking that uh, that uh, that uh, is very very interesting indeed to, to question the work that we do when we go at sea. Uh, another case, other physical phenomena besides the ones that we typically uh, uh, talk about, the, the, the spreading, the, the multipath and whatnot. Uh, I, and for that, I will make use of, uh, of uh, a nice, nice project we CMRE took part in that was a European funded project, MORPH called MORPH, where the idea was to have uh, fleets of uh, very closely operating uh, unmanned uh, vehicles that were able to change their formation according to the type of survey and the type of environment they were encountering. So the, a good analogy would be like transformers, but without the the, 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 the rigid arms, you see, you see, so they would change the formation in, in response to the environment in response to the task at hand. While CMRE did not contribute to the project with any uh, AUV, we did. Our, our task was was to to make sure that the underwater communications infrastructure uh, uh, on board the AUVs and then the whole logic uh, was working uh, uh, as expected to to support this kind of operation, this kind of cooperative operation of the different uh, of the different vehicles. Uh, this project ran between 2012 to 2016. Uh, it was a, a really nice uh, group of people, really nice project. I have very fond memories of it. And uh, we had with us a biology partner uh, as part of the consortium in the University of the Azores. Uh, and, and that also gave us a very interesting opportunity to, uh, to go and, and prepare a demo in the, an amazing part of the world in the middle of the Atlantic. So the idea was to use this sort of teaming to to map uh, marine habitats, and and this was kind of the, the scenario for a demonstration. A very difficult kind of uh, rock with some overhangs underneath, and uh, the idea was to do a very detailed mapping with this team of uh, of, uh, of AUVs that were going around uh, and and autonomously moving from an horizontal survey to a vertical survey of the walls of this rock. Um, and, and with that, uh, uh, producing a very high quality uh, mapping product at the end. Um, so just, just for your idea, I don't know if you, there's no point in, in showing sound, but let me see if I, I don't know if you're hearing the sound. Uh, the idea it, it, this is just for illustration purposes for you to see that, that you can see four AUVs and one at the surface that are basically implementing the, the picture that you saw in the in that other side. You see cables here because that was just the way for the teams at surface to to keep health checks on uh, 
on the vehicles. Nothing was no, there was no power or any sort of commands. It was just for validating that everything was going according to the plan. And at a certain point, what we did was also to do uh, uh, to choose two of those AUVs that were in the water and uh, having one of them uh, sending channel probes or a pseudo random uh, uh, sequence and the other one recording. Uh, and so we just collated those probes uh, uh, um, uh, that, that, that were performed around that rock and put them together in this, in this animation. And you can see here, although the vehicle's distance kind of changes as, as they change formation. Uh, and that's why you see these moves. We, we try to then collate them to, to have some sort of a reference from one to the next. But you see the differences there from very stable to all of a sudden fully disappears the path. And then you have three arrivals to two arrivals to one arrival to no arrivals at all. Every now and again, you just have total occlusions. And we're talking about AUVs that are flying in very short distances from each other, some from 10 to 20 meters. Uh, and this is how dynamic it can get. You see here, all of a sudden, you totally lose anything at all. And this is difficult to explain only by multipath and by, uh, and by absorption and, and whatnot. But if you look at some of the things you would see there around those rocks. You'd see this mess. And especially you see phenomena like this of uh, bubbles being generated by who knows what. Uh, it's important to note that this is also an area of uh, some hydrothermal activity. So there's also that aspect uh, into it. But we understood, it took us some time to understand that very likely the bubbles were playing an important role into uh, into into the, the disruption of underwater combs and uh, uh, recently I, uh, I i i can point you to two very interesting uh, two very interesting uh, uh, talks and, and papers presented in the ucoms uh, conference uh, that uh, that uh, took place last uh, last month in the beginning of September, end of August, beginning of September. Uh, one that talks specifically on the challenges of underwater acoustic communications at short ranges and how how, how Doppler spread can actually be a very tough problem for uh, in, in in many in many applications. Uh, and uh, the the second uh, paper in this uh, reference list uh, uh, talks specifically about uh, bubbles and, and uh, the variability here that uh, Mandar talks about is, is is directly linked to the to the existence of bubbles in the water. So I, I invite you to to go have a look and, and specifically uh, if you if you go to CMRE's YouTube channel, you can actually uh, go and see the uh, the presentations. So the final case here that I have in this part of my presentation has to do with uh, uh, how we approach uh, a lot of times, how we approach underwater communications in the UVs. And I'll, uh, yeah, I'm sure many of you have, have seen that uh, typically we just, okay, is there an AUV, you just strap a modem into it and, and problem solved, we have underwater comms in, in our AUV. And I'll refer back again to the, to the morph and to the fact that uh, CMRE were working with uh, AUVs from different institutions uh, to provide the underwater communications capability. And we noted that there was a big challenge also in making things work, even, uh, even when we did not have bubbles and we have much more benign environments than that one I just showed you. And uh, we had to uh, do some further investigation and we could find something interesting like in one of the AUVs, when we were measuring uh, uh, acoustic, uh, so the no acoustic noise with an external uh, hydrophone, it was just a matter of turning on the horizontal thrusters, was an AUV that had both horizontal and vertical thrusters, to see this kind of difference in what uh, the hydrophone was picking up. We're talking about frequencies that are relevant to underwater communications and to the to the to the equipment that we were using uh, during the project. Uh, it, it went as far as in order to be able to perform some of the missions, we had to limit 
the uh, amount of thrust that uh, could be put in the in the in the in the in the electric motors to minimize this kind of this uh, this acoustic noise so that it wouldn't make the the modems deaf to what was happening so uh, uh, on the right hand side there's a slightly different thing which is not measured by an external hydrophone but measured it was this was measured at the uh, at the analog front end of uh, of the modem we are being used it may not be very visible but you have basically when everything was idle you have this kind of black line here and uh, whenever the vertical thrusters were turned on was enough to be turned on uh, you had the 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 this kind of spikes showing up the vertical uh, in in red and horizontal in blue that were associated with noise uh, being injected by the by the power drivers that were driving the 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 electrical engines so what i what i want to say about this is is uh, that uh, it's very common that we approach underwater cones in the UVs as, as an afterthought. It's something that, okay, we just strap a, a modem whenever, wherever we have space to start the modem, regardless if it's close to the thrusters, regardless of how it's even powered or by the same power source that is powering noisy things. Uh, and, and, and we pay the price. So then it's easy to say that uh, the underwater comms channel is a difficult channel. But if we don't do ourselves any favor and uh, we're just making things uh, uh, much worse for ourselves. So it's uh, just very two very clear examples that the, the digging we had to do to make this work was, was much deeper. Uh, but just two very clear examples of, uh, of the things we, we sometimes do wrong. Uh, when we try to get underwater communications working for us. So there's the, also the, the, now the, okay, nice, but so what? We know channel is challenging. We know we can't accurately predict or quantify many of the aspects of the channel. Uh, and we don't do ourselves any good with our afterthought approaches. But also, another thing is that we are not very good in general at showing to others what didn't go according to plan. So start having this kind of uh, uh, um, existential uh, uh, questions of uh, how many of such situations that we actually experienced. And are there good and bad experiences or are there only experiences and you just need to make the most out of, uh, out of uh, all of them. Uh, uh, so what should we do about this? Should we go and standardize experimental procedures, create experimental registry so that we can all learn about each other's way of going at sea? Should we promote reporting and, uh, and lessons learned? These are all questions and not that I have answers for them, but, but one thing I do know is, uh, is we should incentivize getting over the stigma of the things that don't go according to plan because it really is a sweet spot for, for learning. There is a lot that we have learned because we got our hands dirty and we, had, we, we went through uh, the, the situations uh, that I just showed you. And hopefully, so it's my, my hope is that you could also learn a little bit about it because I'm here and, and, and sh I'm sharing the experience I, I have with you. Uh, I, I would be very interested in, in hearing the, the, audience, uh, the audience opinion about this because I, 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 would, uh, I would even like to see perhaps the promotion of a small work, one day workshop tied with uh, one of the conferences on underwater comms, a workshop just to talk about the things that didn't go right or didn't go according to plan. That's the only thing you can do in that day. That would be an interesting, I would be up for it for sure. Anyway, moving on. Um, another case, slightly different. So now it's a, ca a case for, a, and now for something completely different. Uh, it's the case for the lack of in, in, interoperability, and, and I'm sure you are seeing this coming. You, you, you know what I'm uh, what I'm a, aiming at, uh, but you know that uh, lack of interoperability has very strong practical uh, implications. It has implications that in order to uh, communicate, you need to have a modem of the same color and the same shape at the other end, or metaphorically speaking, of course, because you you basically need to be within the same manufacturer and even same model. And that's wh why uh, CMRE, NATO and partner entities uh, went through the, uh, the, the long effort of, uh, of establishing uh, Janus. Uh, and this is Janus, this gentleman you see here, which is the, the Roman god 
for beginnings and endings and transitions and duality. Uh, and it usually is depicted with these two faces uh, since he's looking at the future and the past. So there's a lot of readings you can make out of that. Uh, in our case, it's the first digital noir communication standard. And NATO went as far as making it available for everyone, which is quite something. Uh, if you go to the NATO um, uh, standardization office website, you can download the uh, the standard specification, the technical specification of genus without any classification markings. It's not even NATO classified. This, this is like my my talk here. There's no classification markings. It means that it's public release. Everyone can can have access to it. Um, it was designed to be so that, that there's important things here. Designed to be simple and robust. So it's not supposed to be the best of anything. It's supposed to be simple for people to implement it. Uh, and it's absolutely not intended to replace or override any of manufacturers' efforts. It's supposed to be something that works alongside what already exists. And you can find uh, uh, some reference implementation in MATLAB and C in the website you see below. I think it's pretty obvious why Genesis is important. Uh, Wi-Fi and whatnot are all built on standards. And uh, we hope uh, that this can break this interoperability barrier that we have experienced until very recently. Uh, so the way we see Genesis being used, not only as a, 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 a um, sorry, the way we see Genesis being used, first of all, as a baseline capability. And so as a baseline capability, basically it's modems of uh, different size and shape, just uh, being able to, to uh, exchange information, exchange data, but also uh, uh the uh, the uh, envisioning a multi-language operation where uh, alongside the manufacturer's pro proprietary modulation coding scheme you have genus used as a as a discovery mechanism in this way that we show here uh you and and the parallel to this is the typical of when you go to a conference and in my case i'm a portuguese and I go to a conference and I start speaking with someone I know, or I don't know the nationality, and if we start speaking in English, and if we, by chance, understand that uh, we are both Portuguese, we, of course, start talking Portuguese. So that's the same parallel you have here. Uh, the idea is not to replace anything that already exists, just to, to maximize the opportunities for things to interoperate. But then practicality gets in the way, right? So. CMRE and uh, the research labs came up with, uh, with this technical specification that was validated at C. Uh, but then, in order for this to become something that people can use, manufacturers need, need, to, uh, need, to, uh, need to implement it in their modems. And that's where the typical and the very real value, value of death between basic research and market penetration uh, comes. And, uh, for in order to try to circumvent that, so this this bridge between CMRE research labs and the industry, we came up with something called the Genus Interoperability Fest. And uh, what the Genus Interoperability Fest was was an opportunity for companies to spend a week at CMRE uh, and try their implementations of Genus in a way that we would all be able to talk amongst uh, um, one another. Uh, so it was a way to help industry to test and cross-validate their own genus implementations and for us all to collectively iron out any possible misunderstandings in the technical specification because, I mean, bear in mind that while this was developed and until 2017, there, was not many, there were not a lot of uh, centers with, uh, with implementations of genus, which meant that we, are, we were in a very difficult position to even validate that everything was correct because we were validating our implementation against our implementation. So the fact that this is now being exposed to more people naturally uh, uncovers some uh, possible misunderstandings or, or, or glitches that need to be ironed out. So, and this was motivated also by the fact that, uh, that as, as I, I mentioned, industry are the ones that can bring and must bring genus capability to the end users. And because after 2017, we're getting more and more of the where can I buy it questions from end users. So we did this uh, joint test for a week in 18 and a week in 2019. Uh, with 
made sure that this was not an evaluation exercise and not a competition between amongst companies. This was a collective uh, uh, environment where the objective at the end of the week was for all the manufacturers to exchange data with all the other manufacturers using Genesis. And that was fully achieved after one week in 18 and after one week in 19. And this was basically the setup. We, 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 we put some tents out, we had two stations in the water and the, the manufacturers basically were occupying like stations inside these this, uh, tents and were deploying their equipment uh, over the, the pier here in, a, in a, the CMRE's premises. And uh, just for your awareness here, this were the companies that participated in the two interoperability fests, 2018 and 2019. Not all of them participated in both. Some participated in both, some participated in only one of the editions. And uh, you may have seen that some of them are actually uh, um, advertising that they have products that uh, are genus uh, capable at the moment. So you can also ask, okay, so, all nice and good. You do the research. You do the the, the 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 science behind it. You do the efforts to try to bring it into into the market, and then what you do with it. And since the early uh, stages of adoption of Genus in the in the in 2017, that uh, a community that has been particularly interested uh, in using it is the submarine uh, rescue uh, community in support for submarine rescue operations or. Maybe in it's they are known as uh, as responses to D sub events. So this sub stand for distress submarine. Uh, and uh, you see here a logo in the lower left corner of Ice Merlot. Uh, Ice Merlot is an institution that was established by NATO, but is actually it actually supports all the nations uh, and pursues the environmental of a global. Uh, submarine operating uh, uh, nations. So, so basically, this is anyone can that operates submarine can be a part of Ice Merlot, and uh, and um, and uh, contribute to to uh, to uh, this kind of uh, environment uh, international environment that is focused in a humanitarian objective, which is saving lives at sea. I mean, we, I'm sure many of you have heard of uh, some very tragic accidents in the past. Uh, the, the, the rather recent one that happened was perhaps Christmas 2018, if, I, if I'm not missing anything, was the, uh, the Argentinian submarine San Juan. Uh, and, uh, and this is something that really motivates uh, the nations that have uh, uh, sailors at sea uh, to try to do more. And interoperability is, is a key aspect because uh, before having a standard for digital water comms, the interoperability aspect of communications for distress submarine was with the, the underwater telephone, which is basically uh, coming on an analog line and uh, saying Alpha, Charlie, Bravos that are then transmitted uh, through the water in an analog way, uh, which creates a lot of problems. Not only you need to have a human, uh, it's very difficult to make this actually be automated and machine to machine, highly inefficient, all the human factors uh, uh, that that come into play. So, so the the idea of making this digital and machine to machine and whatnot has been a great uh, prospect, and that's why the submarine rescue community has been jumping on it. And we've been happy to since 2017, uh, every year except 2020, for the obvious reasons of COVID, we have done experiments with submarines where distressed uh, uh, submarine scenarios were uh, were uh, tested. And uh, basically, the, the once someone on board declares that there is a situation, the data is then collected by the systems on board the submarine, uh, like uh, air pressure, concentration of CO two, of O two. There's all sorts of vital data that are that can be uh, measured inside the submarine, and then that they are packetized in the gems packet and transmitted periodically, and can then be picked up either by some sort of buoy or directly by the ships that are that are around. And, and it's also, we've done experiments where besides the information data flow, we're also triggering uh, some um, behaviors of uh, autonomous underwater vehicles to go in search and narrow down the location of, uh, of the submarine that may be in distress. So this is a, a particularly gratifying way of, of bridging the gap from the science to, uh, uh, to uh, the, the, 
the manufacturers, the industry that, that creates a capability down to the end users where you're trying to solve a real problem. Uh, so another point I would just like to make before I, I close is uh, that Janus uh, uh, could be particularly uh, interesting for the student community. It can be an engaging resource to teach and learn about underwater communications. It's so easy to just get the code and start playing with it and understanding what way, how, how you can make a better receiver. Uh, so that's, there's a lot of, of, of playroom there. Uh, we hope to be able to start issuing uh, JDAS datasets. We have been done that already in a, in a case by case uh, basis, but uh, but uh, we would hope to do more massively uh, the the sharing of some JDAS datasets so that people can play with them. Um, we are, uh, um, uh, I think, we are now well positioned to do this and uh, and to work with uh, with people that would be keen on uh, on giving their contributions to the to the future of Janus. So I would like to just make it clear what Janus is. I think most of you know already and what Janus is not. Uh, you would be surprised how many times this confusion arises uh, and particularly when uh, and I've seen this every now and again whenever someone comes up with a bombastic statement that uh, what we do is faster or better or consumes less power than Janus, it, it's just missing the point. That, that's, the point is not that with Janus. The point is we try to create something that would not consume a lot of computational power, would not make your, uh, your batteries drain quickly, uh, and would be simple to understand and to implement uh, so that it could break this uh, interoperability barrier and, and, and better explore the fact that there are many manufacturers that do excellent equipment and they have a lot of knowledge in, uh, in uh, underwater communications. No, no one wants to override that. Uh, but the work of putting together a standard is, is, uh, it goes well beyond the technical aspects of the underwater communication because also after what is the problem that you're trying to solve and not losing focus of that because the the elusive ideal standard uh, and just to finish in a, in a kind of a funny note uh, i don't know i would like you to try perhaps you have if you go on to google and type ideal standard this is actually uh, the first uh, output that you get so this is just to conclude. Uh, thank you really very much for your attention. And uh, I'm happy for any questions. Happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Joao. Thank you very much. It's uh, very good to have uh, people like you giving this seminar because uh, you really give us the possibility to get into the practical aspects of what underwater communication. Uh, and I mean, of course, the, also the practical contribution very, very important, but uh, I mean, uh, even for our center and the, the participants, I think to have the glance into the hands-on experience is something very valuable. Thank you. Uh, so I invite the participants uh, to leave their question in the chat. We already have a couple of questions. Uh, I guess uh, the second question is maybe something that you have already answered with your last slide as it was left before, but I will start with the first. So is, uh, it says some of your experiments at the cables between equipment. Did you use uh, EM communication in those cases? Well, only by chance. <laughs> I didn't want to. <laughs> so no, the idea was not. Was uh, this is uh, an acoustic uh, communications test bed that we have? It is cabled for convenience of power and to give the instructions and to new scripts for experiments and, and retrieve data from the nodes. Uh, but uh, as a test bed, this is a purely acoustic test bed. For now, we want to expand it to optical also, uh, but and the electromagnetic is currently uh, not in our roadmap. Currently not in our roadmap. I hope uh, that answers did, the question. Did you have any experience, uh, Joe, with electromagnetic for underwater? Because I mean, we always write in our papers that it's so bad, but I mean, I <laughs> the specific experience. So. So sure. I can I think I can recap quickly what what uh, my experience is. I, I I was part I I took part in a demo many years ago a company that showed uh, what they could do. Uh, 
uh, and that company, uh, so I saw a, a kind of a very short range kind of communication uh, scheme where I saw, we saw the data being transferred at, at very short range. Mm -hmm. uh, a few years after, I saw the same company uh, advertising in, in a trade show, advertising their technology for contactless cables, which I found interesting way to, to, to exploit that kind of uh, technology because you know i mean contact mechanically contact is always a source of uh, of problems as time goes by so they were doing uh, uh, wet matable contactless using so on a on a on a pin by pin electromagnetic uh, mm -hmm. uh, communication so basically they were doing wireless cables in a way <laughs> that's why mm -hmm. right. like oxomoronic that, 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 that may sound uh, so i found that particularly interesting as an application, I don't know how, where that stands, and I also find interesting the ability of crossing the uh, air and water boundary. So those are the things I find interesting mm -hmm. in the electromagnetics. Uh, mm -hmm. Other than that, my experience is very, very limited. Okay. Yeah, I see. Thank you. Uh, so the second question, I read it anyway, but I think you have already answered when uh, you wrote that Genesis is a communication protocol in your slide. It says uh, it looks like Genesis is an overlay software type solution, as I understand. If it's the case, there uh, there will be no problem to apply utilize it for all type of equipment from different vendors. Am I right? Yes, I, I think that's a good way to put it. Indeed, it's uh, uh, Genesis in itself. So it's a way to currently in the current specification doesn't mean that uh, I mean one of the things you saw also in my in my slides was that uh, Genesis is not a closed thing it's something that is live and we hope to to evolve it but uh, as it stands now it's a very simple uh, uh, BFSK uh, coding scheme that uh, it's standardized and you can use in your modem uh, uh, it's and, and, and the idea behind it, and as, as, I, as I presented in one of the diagrams, one possible application is precisely to do discovery. It's one possibility is while you, you retain a kind of highly specialized modem, because I mean, as we know, there is no one size fits all for all the environments. There are, there are schemes that are better adapted for long range, for short range, for coastal, for highly reverberant, for noisy. I mean, there is no one single solution. So if you have something that is unspecialized, perhaps you can do a uh, baseline communication. You can do some, some initial node discovery using Janus and then switch to your. So the idea is Janus may be a sole capability provider if you don't have anything else, but can also be something that goes alongside something that already exists and be used as, as the language, as the English of underwater yeah. uh, comms. Yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, we got another question. Uh, and so they say, I want to thank you for the great presentation and sharing your experiences. Uh, we like, I think uh, we have a group of people <laughs> looking at uh, watching the, the seminar together. Uh, to ask where from? Uh, I'm, I'm curious, where from? Yeah, uh, like for example, our guys at TII, I know that they reunite to, to listen to the, okay. to the seminar all together. So I don't know if it's them because unfortunately I see the name of the person as uh, the our marketing uh, person that set up the link and not as the name of the guy that is asking the question. But anyway, uh, or, or the girl, I don't know. So is, uh, we like to ask you how you handle simultaneous communication with multiple engines trying to communicate at the same time. All right. So that that's that the different strategies. So that you're talking about the, the medium access uh, problem of how, how how do you arbitrate the access of different uh, different agents, different AUVs, whatever, different nodes to the same channel. There are, for example, the way Genus was was designed in the way it, it uses uh, the frequency hopping. It was designed in a way that it can uh, just by changing the hopping pattern it can actually uh, you be used in a concurrent way at the same time because it's it's a matter of orthogonality of frequencies and that would basically be a deconfliction in frequency uh, but there's of course the confliction in time uh, that's it, it, typically a, a very a very uh, uh, commonly used scheme that the time division uh, multiplexing where people just you have you assume you have roughly synchronized clocks and you have time slots for the different ones to um, 
to to communicate of course typically that means that you have a very inefficient usage of the channel and uh, we have seen in uh, in many experimental scenarios that even uh, uh, even just passing from from rigid time division to kind of a, more of a arbitrary uh, random access to the channel you can already gain some because you tend to be very it, it's very common to to revert to very a very conservative approach in the time division multiplexing because you you leave a time for the for the for the packet a time for the reverberation you you leave enough time for everything to settle down also to accommodate for the fact that possibly your clocks are not very well synchronized so you tend to to leave big guard times and this means highly inefficient usage of the channel if you're ready to perhaps lose a few packets depending on the information you are passing lose a few packets in the, in collisions perhaps uh, and a very simple aloha to the ma can even do better than uh, than uh, um uh, mac can even do better than to the ma mm -hmm. yeah uh, we have another question i guess the last one probably may is on the same line more or less uh, they thank you for the nice presentation and then uh, the question is is there any explanation for having only one direction communication in some cases for the static node case yeah yeah yeah, yeah. i see well it's interesting. It's it's that diagram I showed you where the in in the static node case where I where I where I motivated it well that the uh, the um, I think I motivated it well that on the on the case where there were mobile nodes perhaps the noise or we have a, a very strong uh, hint that was the noise creating the fact that we have a, a, a one directional. Uh, uh, link in the in the case of the of the static ones, there are many different possible explanations. The fluctuations of the channel are is one of them, because as you pointed out in your previous one, we have the problem of sending exactly at the same time. And what we've seen in that diagram was basically is kind of a round robin. Uh, each minute, the, the cycles were one minute. And each minute on the second zero, one modem transmits, on the second 10, another one, the second 20, another one, second 40, another one. And then you, you construct the picture on a per minute basis. But this means that your, the, the transmissions are not actually at the exact same time. So we're talking about 10, 20, 30 seconds of difference. And that is enough for some channel fluctuation to occur, for some spurious noise to occur and to affect differently uh the different transmissions so uh that is the point that uh, that is perhaps the strongest uh explanation for that uh, to happen others can be even the differences in the uh in the in the analog front end you may have a more sensitive analog front end you may have more noise in the acquisition system that makes that these systems not to be perfectly in balance with one another so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay Thank you, thank you, Joao. So we uh, we have no more question, and also the time is running uh, up. Uh, I just wanted to invite you to the next seminars. Next one will be on the third of November. This is also for the other participants, and uh, yeah, it's actually fun that uh, Joao you mentioned the fact that uh, we should avoid blaming the channel all the time. So next one, uh, when things don't work, right? And the next uh, next uh, seminar will uh, be from uh, Professor Milica Stojanovic from Northeastern University. It will be on uh, channel modeling of the underwater communication. So, Great, I hope I can be there. <laughs> okay, and also, of course, uh, I hope that we will have other ways of collaborating with uh, your group. We will have also other members of your group giving talk for this uh, uh, series. So. Thank you very much, Joao. Very good. It was a pleasure. <laughs> Hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. <laughs>